So now, you're, you're an inventor, not a scientist. Uh, scientists went on to uh, develop the Maxwell's, what we call Maxwell's equations to, to do the mathematical analysis. One of my favorite lines in the history of electric, electro technology is, 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 is that one point Heaviside writes to one of the other Maxwellians and he says, even Hertz is learning to be a Maxwellian. In other words, even Hertz is getting on with this program to create the mathematical understanding of electromagnetic waves. Tesla's not worried about that. Tesla is interested in how can I make this into some sort of product. And he discovers in 1891 that if you take a Geissler tube and you place it between the terminals of your Tesla coil, you're able to induce a glow in the Geissler tube. And Tesla continues to experiment with it, leads to a brilliant demonstration. This is uh, in 1891 before the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. And, and of course, the room is darkened in a moment and Tesla steps between these two big zinc plates, which are connected to a uh, Tesla coil over here. And when he steps between the two plates, he takes those, he's holding what looks like two big white broomsticks or large fluorescent tubes. He rotates those so that they align in the field and they light up brilliantly. And this fascinated people because, again, you have to understand that electricity was all about action at a distance with no connecting wires. And so people were absolutely fascinated by the possibility that you could have a wireless electric lighting system. At least he got, he, he published, he got plenty of coverage in the newspapers. So for the next few years, Tesla patents equipment to develop wireless lighting. He promotes his ideas through a series of lectures, private demonstrations. Here's a private demonstration where indeed the famous American author, Mark Twain, who was a friend of Tesla's, came and, uh, and, and held a large coil of wire. And there's a little light bulb basically right there that is being lit by electrical energy that is going from a, a coil that you can't see to the coil that you can see around, around Twain's head and it's making the bulb light up wirelessly. But what happened is, is this is in the 1890s there was across the world a, a, a depression, a panic, of, of what's known in, in, in American history as the panic of 1893. Nobody was investing in the electrical industry. People had to wait, or basically people were not interested in, in coming forward and investing in a, new, in a new technology. Now in this time period, uh, Tesla experimented with uh, several other alternatives. He, he was one of the first people to follow up on Rentkin's work on x-rays uh, and, and, and began to investigate x-rays in, in 1896. He also decided to do probably, which is one of his most fascinating inventions, to develop a remote controlled, radio controlled boat that, or, that basically, could, basically could be sent out and, and attack the new generation of battleships the, uh, the, the, with heart, but they're not dreadnoughts, they're one generation before dreadnoughts, um, but these new battleships that were heavily armed and made with uh, strengthened armor and people were really quite concerned that the, that the, that the Navy, the, navies, the, Brit the German Navy in particular was not going to be able to be defeated, so any number of people were experimenting with alternatives and there was, as a result, a naval arms race. While he's doing all this, however, Tesla in the meantime changes his mind about how his system should work. He goes back and he thinks about Maxwell and what Maxwell said that these waves that were going to be, that Maxwell predicted um, were going to be like light, but they were going to be invisible. And so the electromagnetic waves, like light, were going to travel in straight lines and Tesla began to think, well, you can have these, 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 these waves radiate from your, um, you know, from your circuit and, uh, and they will go in all directions and only a tiny percentage of those waves will ever arrive at the receiver. And he thought this is, this is, this is just, this is a waste of time. Now, one thing that, you know, as we now know today, but people didn't know for sure until 1924 was the fact that there was the ionosphere, that there was the Van Allen belt that allowed radio waves to basically, you know, you know, bounce up to the ionosphere and come back to Earth. Okay, nobody understood this at the time. So Tesla says, this is not practical. Again, thinking like a maverick, he decides that if you look at his Tesla coil or a radio transmitter, it produces two things. It produces the radiation that goes up into the antenna 
and it can produce a ground current or a current that can go through the ground. So thinking like a maverick, Tesla decided not to do what Marconi and Lodge and other people were thinking about in the top circuit, which is, is, this, is this, that the energy would go from the transmitter up through the atmosphere. This, it, as, as, as Paolo mentioned, I spent 15 years uh, working on, on Tesla, and probably a, a significant piece was to finally get my mind around the fact that, that Tesla was really doing things in a completely opposite direction to the way that his contemporaries were thinking about radio. Now, having made that conclusion and begun to get some, you know, some results in New York City, where he had his laboratory, he temporarily closed his laboratory in New York City and he moved to Colorado Springs, where he was for, as you can see, a number of months in 1899. And there he did conduct, he built a very big Tesla coil, which was his transmitter. This, this fence or wall that you see back there is the primary of the Tesla coil, and this is the secondary. So, do you know that this picture, by the way, is a double exposure? It's a trick. Okay? Because you really don't want to be under those 100 foot, well, these would be. These were actually be about 50 foot sparks right there. Okay, so what Tesla did is, is this, and Tesla was fascinated with photography, and he was also very interested again in creating pictures that captured the imagination. And he really struggled with wireless power to come up with a way to express to people vividly just how much power he was he was working with. And so these pictures, there's it's of series. This picture is the most famous of a series of about 60 photographs. Because the way this picture was done is, 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 is essentially all the electrical equipment was turned off. Tesla sat down in the, in the chair. They used flash photography. They took a picture of him in the chair. This is all using glass plates. They then turned on the electrical equipment, generated the sparks, and away, and you got the picture that you see there. Now, what Tesla was trying to do with this large transmitter was send power through the ground to some remote location not that far away. And one of the few pictures or evidence of what he was accomplishing is, 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 is he took a very large coil, this coil probably was taller than me, and was grounded, and it had like a little antenna that you can see on the top, and it made this one little light bulb, one little incandescent light, light up. Now, of experimental evidence to confirm his theories. So the fact that he could get this little light bulb to work was enough for him, because he knew he was right. He knew that you could send power through the earth, this would all work out, and, and everything was a great possibility. So he didn't do any elaborate demonstrations, he didn't call in any reporters, and we don't even know exactly how far this coil sat from this transmitter in Colorado Springs. Okay, it probably sat, this one probably sat out in a cow pasture, and from what I can tell, having visited Colorado Springs once, and seeing the mountains, this is, I can kind of picture, I can kind of guess where this, this was, but it was no more than a quarter of a mile or half a mile away from the, the actual transmitting station. But Tesla was sure that he was on the right track. Returns to New York, um, in 1900 he writes a treatise about increasing or ch the, the entire future of, of society by um, by improving or, or generating more energy. It's the magazine story that uh, Paolo mentioned that was in the Century Magazine. And in 1901, for reasons that I still, I'm, still tr I, I'm still not happy as to how, how it came to pass, Tesla Secure made a, made, a rela made a relationship with J.P. Morgan, and Morgan agreed to loan him $150,000. Tesla immediately began to build a new laboratory or a new experimental station out on the north shore of Long Island, near where today the Brookhaven National Laboratories are. And this is the building that they recently raised several million dollars for on the web uh, as a result of a, a Kickstarter campaign. So this is the building that has been saved. Uh, the key thing along with the building, of course, was this tower. So this is where the, the, the generating equipment was. The Tesla coil that was the main part of the transmitter was probably out here, and 
One terminal of the Tesla coil was connected into the ground, the other was connected up here into the top of the tower. The main event, remember, was not sending energy through the tower, but sending energy through the ground. So as a result, he dug a very deep shaft and he drove iron pipes at the bottom of the shaft out so that, as he said, I can get a grip on the earth and shake it, shake it electromagnetically. And all through this entire process, Tesla assumed that if he got all the illusions right, he was, if he was living at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, he had taken money from J.P. Morgan, he was still getting positive uh, newspaper interviews, everything was falling into place, that sooner or later the technical side of things would fall into place. Well, one of the things that he didn't take into account was this, 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 that there was this Italian upstart named Marconi. Marconi was always regarded by Tesla as an upstart, Tesla had started studying electromagnetic waves as early as 1889, 1890. Marconi only gets involved in a serious way to starting to think about these things circa 1895. And so Tesla sort of says, well, I'm the, I'm the guy that you know, in, got involved in this first. And, uh, and so, but Marconi basically you know, pursue, pursues a very different strategy. He decides to focus not on power, which is what Tesla's thinking about, how do you transmit power through the earth, but on sending messages. There's a clue in exactly the title of what Marconi was, was working on. He was working on wireless telegraphy. Can we send telegraph messages without wires? Okay? And, and it was the right niche for at least Marconi to develop. Worried that Tesla was going to get ahead of him because Tesla came back to New York City in 1900 and he announced that it is only a matter of time, a few months, in Tesla's usual grand way, that I will send a message across the Atlantic. And in fact, I'll send a message across the Pacific. So worried about this, Marconi decides in the fall of 1901 that he will do the, he will do the great leap and that he will try to send a message across the Atlantic. Up to this point, Marconi had been on in very specific increments, five miles, 50 miles, 100 miles, the, across the English Channel, and, and so he was doing it in a very measured way. Tesla, Marconi decided that if he did not do this, then, then Marconi would lose all sort, begin to lose credibility with his financiers and with his investors. So, in the fall of 1901, and probably at the last possible moment that the weather would permit it, in December, Marconi finally heard three dots that were sent from England, from Cornwall, across the ocean to St. John's, Newfoundland. And this is, I think, one of my favorite uh, pictures of Marconi where he is, he's, I, we, I don't, you know, he's sitting there sort of saying, well, I did it. You know, that we would say, you know, the, he's, uh, uh, he's the cat that got the mouse, would be the American phrase. So. Now, it's 1902. You have been scooped by Marconi. And you can sort of make kind of snide comments about Marconi and that Marconi is not as smart or as talented as you are. But what, if you're Tesla, do you tell J.P. Morgan, the most powerful financier in the world? So in response, Tesla says, look, this is a lot bigger than sending a few little dots and dashes across the ocean. We're going to create a world telegraphy system. We're going to have a few power plants, like the one I have on the North Shore of Long Island, not far from New York City, and we're going to gather up at those plants all the information that you possibly could want. Stock quotes, telephone messages, telegraph messages, facsimile messages, all sorts of things. Newspaper reports that are being already sent by wire all around the world. And those plants are going to feed that, that information into the ground, and it is going to be transmitted through the earth, everywhere. And everyone will have a small receiver, as Tesla liked to say, no bigger than a pocket watch, to receive all that information. And as he said in that, this famous letter from 1902, the whole earth is like a brain, as it were, and the capacity of the system is infinite. You see, Mr. Morgan, the revolutionary character of this idea, its civilizing potency, its tremendous money-making power. Now, Tesla, let me assure you, had no idea about packet switching 
or about computer programs or how to do all of the things that need to happen in a small device like this. But he is thinking about a revolution in information, personal information, in 1902. To put this into perspective, in it's only in 1907 that Henry Ford introduces the car for the masses. That the idea that you're going to make a series of devices, high-tech devices, that everyone is going to have is only taking form in this period. And Tesla is one of the first people that thinks about this. And I often argue that Tesla, much more than, and, than it, many people say, ah, oh, well, Tesla is the man who invented the 20th century. And I say, ah, I agree with that if we say that the 20th century is, is the century by which the, um, we develop a, cons a consumer society. Here's a picture of what Tesla had in mind, and I only call your attention to the fact that in, in this central picture, there's a, somebody receiving radio messages or, or messages on their yacht with a parasol, and she is holding up her parasol like this to get the latest messages. She's perhaps at a resort like Sarasota, Saratoga, and she is getting messages by holding up her parasol and receiving, receiving the messages. It's, there's some newspaper uh, fancy imagination, but it, it underlines how people saw, or Tesla saw this as being a consumer revolution. Now, Tesla, you have to ask, would Wardenclyffe have worked? That is to say, the plant, the system that Tesla developed. And I sort of say, well, it depends on whether, from an electromagnetic standpoint, you think the Earth is like an ocean or a water balloon, so a, a, a child's balloon that you fill up with water. Okay. If the Earth is like a water balloon, which is what Tesla is trying to illustrate here, you could have a little pump. The Earth, the ball, is filled with water. It's an incompressible fluid, and so as you pump on one side of the water balloon or the earth, eventually if you reach the resonant frequency of the balloon or of the earth, the water will come squirting out in these little one-way valves. But notice that I said it has to be that the earth is filled with an incompressible fluid. Supposing the earth, from an electromagnetic standpoint, is filled with a compressible fluid. Then the situation is like an ocean, where you can drop a stone, where I grew up on the eastern shore of, of America, New Jersey, and you could imagine that the waves will go all the way to Spain on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, but of course those waves are going to dissipate because their energy is going to be absorbed by the fact that water is a, is a, compressible, a compressible fluid. Okay. More than that, the other question is, is, is how do you actually, from an electromagnetic standpoint, grip the Earth and shake it? And I don't think Tesla ever figured that out. Now, before you sort of say, ha, what a, as we'd say in America, what a space cadet. Um, the, keep in mind that Marconi did not fully understand why he was able to transmit waves over long distances. Uh, and in fact, when he receives the Nobel Prize, his entire speech for the Nobel Prize is trying to come up with some sort of physics explanation as to why it worked the way that it did. So, did Tesla contribute to radio? Often a question that I get. If you're talking about radio as broadcast communications, that is to say the box that we have in our house that plugs into the wall but picks up signals from the air, Tesla did not invent radio. Invo that, that invention involved a whole lot of other people. If, however, you sort of say, who is the, one of the earliest people that wrestled with the problem of how you take this new idea, electromagnetic waves, and shape it into some kind of technology, some sort of useful devices, then Tesla has an important part to play in the story. He underlines how hard it is to go from that idea, what Maxwell and Hertz were doing, to a practical product, to do something that is, is a disruptive, what we now are frequently talking about as disruptive technologies. Wireless power today, and, and I hope that some of our other speakers will uh, talk, to, talk more about this, um, has some applications. Uh, it was used in the 1980s to a little after, for 20 years by the US Navy 
to communicate with submarines under water by using a huge antenna array that basically sent extra low frequencies through the earth. You can purchase today, uh, you know, in, 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 at least in America, a small tray which you can then put your smartphone on and your smartphone will charge up if it has a special back. And there is a coil in the little tray, there's a coil in the special back for your phone and wirelessly they will power them up. The vision is, is, is that someday you will never have to take your phone out of your purse or out of your pocket. You can just walk into the room and as soon as it, it, it detects that it's in the field, it will start charging up. Tesla's later years were not particularly happy. He had a nervous breakdown in 1905. Um, he worked on a number of different things uh, throughout his later career, including um, a particle beam weapon, which you can ask me about in the, in the question and answers. Um, which, uh, you know, and many people think that the, the FBI and the, and the U.S. government, uh, you know, seized Tesla's papers and, and, have, and have basically secreted away this invention. Well, I'm not sure that it ever, it ever was anywhere near close to, to working. I agree with the scientists that were called in by the government to examine Tesla's papers that it wasn't really a possible thing. Tesla is not particularly remembered from the 1950s for, you know, until, to, until recently uh, for a number of reasons. There was no major corporation named after him until Tesla Motors turned up that was created by Elon Musk about 10 years ago. There was no company that carried on the Tesla name, at least in America. There were certainly Tesla appliances produced in the Czech Republic uh, during the 1950s. Um, and he was a problematic figure for at least Americans in that he really didn't play into the myths that we had about innovation. He, didn't, he couldn't really reflect Yankee ingenuity. He was not <coughs> native born in America. He was not a hard-working, tinkering sort of individual like Henry Ford or Thomas Edison. And at the same time, he didn't reflect the tendency to expect that new technologies such as the atomic bomb or the transistor that were coming out of R&D labs were really the basis, basis of new technology. And he was perceived as being intuitive and being, a, and being something of a mystic. So why is he back today? He's back because in part, straightforwardly, you just have to you know, look at the, the cover that they chose for the, my book, and uh, his eyes follow you around. He was tall, dark, handsome, and mysterious. I cannot tell you that one of the more alarming things is, is, is to do a little book signing uh, and go to a particular town, and there are, there are uh, older women who show up. And they're not coming to see me, they're coming to see him because they are just fascinated by him. He's a classic underdog pushing against big business, against the status quo, the pro and often promised free energy. And I think, as I talk about in the conclusion of the book, he has a real power or, or attraction for people who want to have cutting edge technology without having to deal with the rationality of science or of corporate capitalism. And as one motors a fan of the new Tesla car wrote on a, on a blog, you can have th 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 this new electric car, which is, has a very small carbon footprint, doesn't produce any pollution, so it's green. You can have green with a bite. Okay? In other words, you can have your environmentally correct car, but it's terrifically fast. So let me close by showing you this, this picture that many of you have seen. And to remind you that in many ways, Tesla was a pioneer of electrical technology because what he did was to transmit, figure out a way to transmit power all over the world using two or three phase currents. And that this is the fact that we, most, of that, most of the lights that you see turned on in that picture are the result of using alternating current and Tesla's many inventions. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.